no matter if you don't feel deserving, you deserve it. <laughs> a lot of people don't feel deserving, and that's crazy, because you are love. Oh, good morning again, and I want to start out my talk with our yearly theme, Living Out Loud. You remember that? We're six months into that, so I want to know, how is that serving you? How are you living out loud, and how is that serving you in your life's journey? We all know that the energy of the universe is everywhere. And everything is energy. So when I look out today, I see beautiful mass light. Spirit illuminated. Over here, I see a little dimming. I don't think someone slept good last night. <laughs> Over here, there's a little dimming of the light also. Maybe you're not feeling great today. But we are all here together, all of us illuminating our light to, for everyone else to see, because we are truly all connected and sharing with each other. So according to pop culture, Living out loud means living your life with sass, spice, and flair. The Urban Dictionary elaborates further to include living genuinely open and trustworthy. So put simply, living out loud is the practice of being yourself and not listening to anyone else's opinions of you. So be yourself. I especially like the part about living out loud means sass, flair, and spice. You remember the Spice Girls? Yeah, yeah, let's go, so good. So for the next six months, while we continue to live out loud, have that be your mantra. You know, everything you do, live it with zeal, live it with zest, and live it with joy. Today, my talk is going to be short because we have a very special presentation at the end of the service. So I just wanted to let you know that. Not because I didn't prepare. <laughs> I know some of you thought that, but it wasn't because of that. Because I've been preparing. Believe me, this is a tough one. So um, the theme for June is embracing self-care. So to live your life to the fullest, Self-care must be embraced on a daily basis with your spiritual practices. It's through self-awareness of the mind and the body and the spirit that we realize that we are a perfect entity and that we have all we need always for our highest and best good to be successful, and to live life to our highest potential. We have it all. It's all at our fingertips, right here, right now, today. You don't need to do anything else, but know that, depend on that, and receive that. It's our divine inheritance. We have everything we need. We have all the love we need. We have all the joy we need. We have all the resources right here at our fingertips. But when I think of self-care, I immediately thought of spa day <laughs> at Glen Ivy. Going to the mud bath, going to the spa, going to get a massage and a facial and just relaxing. That was, you know, self-care. That was what I, that's exactly what I thought about, just relaxing. That kind of care is very important also, but it's only the tip of the iceberg. We must also care for our mind and our spirit in addition to our physical body. 
When I think of self-care, I think of love. We need to, first of all, love ourselves. That's the highest self-care that we could give each other. Loving ourselves. So that leads to today's topic. Balancing grief with joy. Grief is such a personal thing. It's hard to, it was, I won't say hard, it was uncomfortable, maybe a little difficult, researching this because, you know, we have all had grief. But it needs to be said, and we need to be able to go through it. It's been said that one of the hardest things you will ever have to do is to grieve for the loss of a person who is still alive. That's a loss of a love relationship that has failed. You've lost that other person. A loss because of mental illness or of addiction. I've been grieving for 16 years over my granddaughter. There's, it's a grief, and you work through it. You grieve for the... I have a very close friend who has, has um, dementia and lost short-term memory, has long-term memory, but lost short-term memory, and it's frustrating for them. So you grieve for their pain and for their loss. We also grieve for the loss of the connection we have with a parent or a sibling that we've had a conflict with and resentment with, and we're no longer connected. There's a real grieving there because we've lost part of our family. So balancing grief with joy kind of is an oxymoron to me. It's kind of, you know, doesn't sound like it should go together. But His Holiness the Dalai Lama says this, the way through sadness and grief that comes from great loss is to use it as a motivation and to generate a deeper sense of purpose. There is a poem by Hafiz, the Persian po poet who was born in 1325 in Iran. And it's called The Sacred Dance for Life. <clears throat> Sorry. This is it. I sometimes forget that I was created for joy. My mind is too busy, my heart too heavy for me to even remember that I have been called to dance the sacred dance for life. I was created to smile, to love, to be lifted up and to lift up others. Oh, sacred one, untangle my feet from all that ensnarls. Free my soul that we might dance and that our dancing might be contagious. Hafiz. In this human physical experience, we are all born and eventually we will all die and pass away. So everyone will experience grief and sadness to a degree. But not everyone knows how to handle these strong emotions during these grieving times. We all have to learn that for ourselves. And we have to learn how to find that joy within us again. My first experience with grief was when I was 11 years old and my Grammy died. She was only 58 years old, and it was a shock and a surprise to us all. I was very close to her, as close as you could get, and it really hit me hard. But it was nothing compared to what my mom went through during that time. Jane Goodall says that the depth of our grief is a reminder 
of the depth of our love. So what is grief if not love persevering? I have talked to several friends and families, some of them here today, about preparing this talk. They all tell me they're grateful for the time that they did have together with their loved ones. And sometimes it was a wonderful release, sometimes it was sad, but it was always a feeling of gratitude for having been loved like that. The researchers say that the death of your child, no matter what the age, and the death of a spouse or a life partner is the most severe. It's because you're so woven together through your life, through your love, that you're entangled. So when that person leaves the physical plane, it feels like you're severed. It feels that way. Your feelings and your emotions are raw and exposed. And your heart feels broken. Rumi says, the wound is where the place where the light enters. I never understood that one, but now I do. It's when your wounds are open, the light of God and the presence of God's love can enter you. And it is the place where the healing begins, for sure. The healing begins then. So this quote from Rita Mae Brown made me have a new perspective on loss and sadness. She says, sorrow is how we learn to love. Your heart isn't breaking. It hurts because it's getting larger. It's getting larger. And the larger it gets, the more love it holds. She has a memory of grief and she says, I still miss those that I loved who are no longer with me, but I find I am grateful for having loved them. The gratitude has finally conquered the loss. So there's number one, gratitude. The gratitude has finally conquered the loss of the loved one. Grief is a mixture of emotions, and it can be tough to understand what they are until you're right in it. And, though the and through this cloud of, of sadness and loss, Beams of sunshine can shine through. Joy can happen in the midst of grief with support of your friends and your family and with patience, both can happen. Patience, don't push yourself through it. Be with it, sit with it. I was reading a story and I don't remember all the different names and everything, but I can tell you that it was uh, a woman who was doing, uh, publishing a paper on the uh, Canadian Indians and the violation that happened there. And while she was preparing this, um, this article, she got a severe pain through her arm. It went all the way up through her neck. And so she went to the doctor, she had x-rays, she did all this stuff. And they said, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. So she finally went to the Indian shaman, and he said, you, you need to grieve. You, you need to grieve for what happened 150 years ago, 100 years ago, 15 years ago. You haven't grieved for them, and you need to do it. So she left, and she went out into nature, and she sat by a stream, and she camped there, and she grieved for two weeks and the pain was gone. She was holding that grief within, within her body. So, you know, it affects everything. So we need to uh, be patient with ourselves and to 
Remember the gratitude. Remember the gratitude. Meister Eckhart says that truly, it is in the darkness that one finds the light. So that when we are in sorrow, then this light is the nearest to all of us. This light, of course, is the energy and the presence of God and the God's love that God has for us. So this brings us to the how. How do we do it? How do we balance our grief with our joy? Like I said, you don't have to wait until your grief is over before you can find that joy again because that doesn't happen because grief is a thing that it changes. It changes. You get, you get a new normal, but that a bit of that grief is always with you. So we learn to move through it and live with it and... Um, we have our spiritual practices to help us through, through that. And we create a new way of life after that person is gone. So when you understand that you can have complex emotions all at the same time, then you might feel a little more open to having happiness and joy in your life. I know people think they shouldn't feel joy, they shouldn't feel happy, they shouldn't have fun because they're grieving. But no, that's what heals us. That's what gets us out of that and moves us forward. Finding joy while grieving sounds like a mixed message. But weaving sparks of happiness together with the sadness is how the healing begins. Grief has a very holy purpose. Through our feelings of loss, we actualize true gratitude. When we begin to see the depth of our grief as reflecting the depth of our love, then we know that the healing begins. Winnie the Pooh, and Winnie the Pooh has a lot of good things to say, but Winnie the Pooh says this, how lucky I am to have something that makes saying goodbye so hard. That's so cute. Isn't that the truth? The price of deep love is deep grief. The prophet Cahil Gibran says, the deeper sorrow carves into your being, the more joy you can contain. So there it is. You know, it is, there is a balance. There is a balance there. And the joy that you feel heals your mind and heals your body. So we balance grief with gratitude. Grateful for the time that we did have together. Grateful for all the beautiful memories that we shared our time together. The memories are priceless. After my dad passed away 11 years ago, I brought joy into that grieving by remembering the trips that we took. We went to the Amazon together. We went to Machu Picchu. We went to Palau and Angar, the islands in the Marshall Islands where he spent his years uh, as a Navy man when he was during the war. We went back and visited that little island together. It brought me such joy to have those memories with him. But my fondest memory is when I was a kid, at least once a month, my dad and my mom and my brother and I, my brother who's here today, we would go out into the desert and we'd catch snakes and lizards. And it's a wonder my mom didn't do that. She stayed in the car. <laughs> although she tolerated it. But we would catch iguanas, and then one time Greg thought he, he went and picked up a, he said, oh, look what I caught, and it was a baby rattlesnake. I'll never forget that one. So, no, it's a, you know, and that was wonderful, joyful, fond memories. And by remembering things like that with my dad, 
the healing began. My mom and I, we attended, after dad passed away, a, a grief group that was here in San Clemente once a week for six months. And it was so helpful to have that support group. And of course, we had all of our friends and the family um, you know, you know, that we supported each other. And that's really what helps during a difficult time. So in closing, I want to share with you a beautiful poem my, my, by my beloved Jahaladeen Rumi, and this is called Bird Wings. Your grief for what you've lost lifts a mirror up where you, can, where you are bravely working. Expecting the worst, you look, and instead, there is a joyful face that you've been wanting to see. Your hand opens and closes and opens and closes. If it were always a fist or always stretched open, you would be paralyzed. Your deepest presence in every small contracting and expanding, the two as beautifully balanced and coordinated as bird wings. That is balancing grief with joy. I choose to embrace joy. Thank you. Thank you. Let us pray. In this most holy and sacred moment, we recognize and we acknowledge and we know that there's only one life. This is God's life, this is our life, and it is so good. It is the first cause to all of creation. It is unconditional love. It is compassion, empathy, it is kindness. All the qualities of God live and move and express as each and every one of us. We are the light, we are the joy, we are the presence of this divine essence. And we are an excellent idea idea in the mind of God. We are perfect in our imperfect way. And so today I affirm and I decree that all is well. And then as we go through our life, balancing our life through grief and joy and happiness and sorrow, we depend on prayer. We depend on meditation. We depend on being in nature and in the silence, knowing that we are all connected. There is no disconnect. We are one. And so knowing I speak the truth and this truth truly does set us free. Set us free to be the illuminated spirit that we are. So I anchor my prayer in joy. I anchor my prayer in love. I let it go, I let it be, and say with me, and so it is. So it is, amen.